Good evening, everybody. Uh, you're all very welcome uh, to this Irish Wildlife Trust uh, webinar. I'm coming to you this evening from uh, a lovely sunny Galway, uh, lovely to be by the sea. And um, we're talking about something this evening that I think um, is possibly one of the most important topics uh, in current affairs at the moment uh, and, and really doesn't get enough attention, I think, in our in our media and so on. So uh, I really thought it'd be very useful to uh, to have this discussion about uh, food security. Uh, many of you may have uh, only heard the term with uh, the, uh, the Russian invasion of Ukraine back in February. Uh, because Ukraine produces an awful lot of uh, the world's wheat and uh, very quickly there was talk about uh, threats to food security, food shortages and so on. Um, but at the same time, we're also told uh, by uh, international metrics that Ireland is one of the most food secure countries in the world. So. I thought it'd be very useful to try and delve into this a little bit, find out what is food security, what does it mean? Um, is Ireland food secure, really? Um, uh, if we uh, aren't, then uh, what do we need to do to be food secure? Um, so, um, so that's what we're going to talk about this evening. So now, just before I introduce our speakers, uh, just to give you a little uh, background uh, to the Irish Wildlife Trust, we are a national non-governmental organisation. We've been around since 1979, and our job is to raise awareness uh, of the importance of wildlife uh, and nature to people. And of course, we do an awful lot of uh, communication work. And uh, for my own part, I, I work as campaign officer, so working on various policies around the protection of biodiversity. So if you support our work, please do consider joining. Um, it's a small annual fee. You get to support our work. You get to attend uh, events like this one this evening, which we try to keep uh, free and widely available. And you'll also get a copy of our uh, beautifully colourful quarterly magazine, uh, which is full of interesting uh, articles. This webinar is... Uh, recorded. So uh, when it is over, we put it up onto our YouTube channel. And when you go onto YouTube, you'll find uh, a whole wealth of information. Uh, since we started doing uh, webinars uh, over a year ago, um, on all kinds of topics uh, around the environment and nature and wildlife uh, in particular, everything from, from farming to rewilding and marine protected areas and sharks and all kinds of things. Uh, so please, it's a, it's a fantastic resource. Please do go on and check it out. So the format for our talk this evening, uh, we have two great speakers <clears throat> and each of them are gonna give a presentation. Uh, that will be about 20 minutes each or so, and then we'll use the remainder of the time to ask uh, questions and have some discussion. So at the bottom of your screen, you will see uh, there's a Q&A button and there's also a chat button. So please, uh, by all means, use the chat button for discussions between yourselves. But if you have questions, please use the uh, Q&A function. Uh, and that saves me monitoring uh, two uh, different screens. So I'll go to the Q&A for actual questions. Um, uh, and that's pretty much it for me. So um, without further ado, I will introduce our first uh, speaker, who is Bridgie Murphy. And Bridgie is a land and human rights lawyer uh, turned farmer and is coming to us this evening from County Sligo. And she's also the project manager of the agroecological farming organization Tull of Bio, Soil, her, the Soil uh, Biodiversity European Innovation Partnership Project, which is, which is uh, I'm sure Bridgie will tell us more about what, what those projects are. And her research and advocacy focus includes differing forms of land use, tenure and management, and the role of women in farming and food systems. So thank you very much for joining joining us uh, this evening, Bridgie, and over to you. Thanks, Parik. Uh, let's have a look. We'll just share the screen. We should be off. There we go. So I'm hoping that I'm not going to insult anybody's intelligence by coming at this from a very, very, very basic perspective. Um, sometimes we have differing kind of points of, of entering the, the discussion. So it made sense that we all come into it uh, from, from a similar place. So to have a look at what is food security, 
uh, food security is defined by the United Nations um, Committee on World Food Security means that all people at all times have physical, social and economic access to sufficient, safe and nutritious food that meets their food pre pre preferences and dietary needs for an active and healthy life. It's important to note, though, that it's not only about having enough food to go around, but that the food has to leave people nutritionally secure. Um, and we, we, we know that there's massive health outcomes where people are not nutritionally secure, although they have the calories. And the third point is that we also need to look at food security for all. Um, it is very important to look at food security for Ireland, but I think that it's important to have a global long-term perspective on the matter and also look at how to deliver food security through shorter, more resilient supply chains, which would be then having a focus on local food production. So every person on the planet needs to eat. Uh, producing and consuming food and drink underpins our cultures, our economies, and our use and management of the natural world around us. Most of the time, we don't think too much about where our food comes from or how, or where or by whom it was produced. Um, but on a daily basis, billions of people get up and go about planting, growing, tending to livestock, harvesting, processing and transporting food to markets in a myriad of different ways. And consumers then get to choose what to eat basically based on what is available and what they can afford. We're producing food and distributing food for an increasing global population in a perfect storm of natural and man-made challenges and shocks. We just have to look at Brexit, the COVID pandemic and the war in the Ukraine for recent or ongoing examples of these man-made shocks. The result is food security for some now and the very real threat of more food insecurity for many others in the decades to come. And this is especially so for places like the Horn of Africa and other countries that are reliant on, say, for example, wheat from the Ukraine. 50% of grain uh, for food support programs comes from the Ukraine. So in the EU, although our food might get a little bit more expensive, um, for other countries that grain is vital. The other thing to note, of course, is that peace and security for countries depends a lot on food security. Food and farming, uh, food and food production is also happening um, in the context of extreme and erratic weather and natural disasters, for example, floods and droughts, where severe pressures and conflict already exist on natural resources um, and on, on your natural resources like water and arable land. And much of that water and land is already degraded or severely polluted. These are but a few critical issues which are forcing some very pertinent discussions on and responses to ensuring food security. Food systems are the mechanisms that deliver food security and the current dom dominant models are fragile and failing. So many of the world's, world's agricultural models and food systems are fragile and failing. As I said, the COVID pandemic, Brexit and the war in the Ukraine are recent examples of shocks that have exacerbated the cracks and the fragilities. Our dominant global food system is a finely tuned phenomenon, transporting huge quantities of food from one part of the world to another. It provides people with food security, but unfortunately it also hides a huge number of hidden costs, which society is no longer wanting to tolerate and which our environments can no longer sustain. Much of the system, well, I can actually come back, but much of the system is based on specialized production, which in turn is dependent on high external input agriculture. And that meaning that we rely on intensive agrochemical and machinery use, uh, cheap labor conditions, or the replacement of labor completely with, with technology and innovations. It relies on excessive transport costs, which redistribute produce all around Europe or the world. And the entire system is dominated by private corporations, which ensure that they retain the profits that are being made, while the ever increasing financial and other costs are borne by the farmers and the environment. Our system in Ireland is no exception to this rule. Uh, in Ireland, an overwhelming focus is placed on the large-scale production of dairy, beef, and lamb, 
uh, for these corporations to export to high value markets really in the UK and the EU and beyond. Much of this product is production dependent on the external inputs such as fertilizer chemicals and animal feeds which have been shipped halfway around the world. It's also dependent on inequality, um, structural inequality in our distribution of cap resources and supports to create and favor bigger or more productive farmers at the expense of diverse mixed farming enterprises. Food prices have been falling for decades. Uh, cap and the cheap food policy helping out a lot with that. But now as the real cost of energy and shocks are factored in, we're starting to see food inflation. The more vulnerable sectors of society are trapped with high housing costs, your rents and mortgages, and find it difficult to absorb the increase in food prices being passed on to them. Farmers have been selling at cost or below cost in some instances, and they cannot absorb the increased costs either. Food processes in the small and medium enterprises categories sit with the same problem. The only places we rarely see profit being made is the fertilizer companies or the people selling the fertilizer, the meat processes, the dairy corporations, and the GDP. These food systems are not delivering the right to adequate nutritious food for all. Ironically, our food systems are actually contributing to food insecurity. And this is not just in the form of the lack of food, but food which is nutrient deficient and contributes to negative health outcomes. At the same time, recent reports have found that our dominant food systems are contributing up to about one third of the greenhouse gas emissions, up to 80% of biodiversity loss, and use of up to 70% of freshwater resources. There are other more sustainable food production systems which need to be recognized as essential solutions to these existing challenges. It is possible to feed a growing global population while protecting the planet. Despite challenges to global supply chains, COVID-19 showed us the resilience of local and regional food systems and smaller farmers in the Ukraine are managing to feed people while commercial farms are exporting. Around the world, people engaged in food systems are providing nutritious foods for billions of people while safeguarding biodiversity and critical ecosystems. It's important to note then that our food systems hold the power to realize a shared vision for a better world. Now, I just want to look at the Irish response to, to food insecurity. And generally what we hear the government and the Department of Agriculture saying is how much island exports to the rest of the world and how much that contributes to the GDP and how many jobs are created by that. But approximately two thirds of those exports go to high value markets with the balance going to, to the rest of the world. But the narrative that we hear from, from the department and from, from the, uh, as I say, the, the, the current food system proponents is that Ireland has to increase our current production to feed the world. But when we look at this current production model, we find that yes, we are exporting meat from Ireland. Um, though, as I've mentioned, it's to your higher value markets. We're not exactly feeding the poorest of the poorer people in the world. Instead, we are actually drawing from those world food supplies, uh, grains and cereals to feed our livestock. Even though we are exporting animal calories from Ireland, mainly in the form of dairy, beef and lamb, these products contain less food energy than the imports of cereals, sugar and vegetable oils we import to feed that livestock. So increasing Irish food output within the existing agricultural model will just lead to increased food energy imports, as I say, diverting cereals away from human food supply and towards animal feed. Realizing this, the department and, and our government's response has been to divert funds and commitments away from the real solutions towards minimizing the amount of grain and protein crops we're going to have to import. So we've recently seen Minister McConnellogue making supports available to farmers to, to grow grain and to, um, to pay for, for the, fer the increased fertilizer, fertilizer costs that they're going to be incurring for making the animal fodder. Um, and if there ever was a time really to convert to weaning off of the stuff, it would be now. But instead, 
we're looking at derogations um, on land that's been set aside for biodiversity and possibly, I mean, it hasn't been announced, but possibly a nitrates directive a derogation as well. But under this approach, we might need to import less grain, but we've moved further away from the solutions that we'd like to see in the farm to fork and biodiversity strategy. And we're spending the money that really is actually needed for implementing solutions. So food systems need to transform to become more resilient, sustainable and equitable. Agroecology, food sovereignty and women, I would argue, have a crucial role to play. And I will get on to looking at what we mean by agroecology and food sovereignty in a minute. But the important things to note here is that transformative action demands the engagement and close participation of the people who drive our food systems, such as farmers, herders, farm workers and fisher folk. Women also have a crucial role to play in food security, and they should be at the heart of every food system or food security conversation that we're having. Women are currently not recognized or acknowledged enough for their role, and they don't get the supports or at least targeted supports that are needed. We need to gender mainstream our uh, policies and programs um, for how they help women to take their place in this conversation and debate. Also, we need to look and have a look and see where food sovereignty and agroecology are popping up. And that would be, say, for example, in the Sustainable Development Goals, especially Sustainable Development Goal 2, which aims to end hunger, achieve food security and improve nutrition, and to promote sustainable agriculture. We know that the triple burden of, of malnutrition, which really underpins this one, came about when a lot of countries ended up giving up their more diverse nutritious diets with calorie rich staples that had come out of the post green revolution era. So I'm going to move on now and have a look at who is Tullif Beal and what solutions does Tullif Beal have as an organization to assist in both food security and the essential transformation of our food systems. So Tullif Bio is a member-led organization run by farmers who have a direct experience of the issues that we campaign on. We are a relatively new organization on a mission to grow our numbers. Um, we need the numbers and the public support literally to be at the tables where agricultural policy and programs, uh, supports and schemes are being determined if we want to deliver the transition to the type of food and farming systems that protect the well-being of land farmers and the citizens of Ireland. So I did um, put up our website um, on the first slide, but I would encourage everybody to go and have a look at talifbo.ie and see what it is that we're doing. So we are agroecological rather than industrial model farmers. We farm in ways which benefit and restore natural ecosystems and build healthy living soils. And for those new to the term, agroecology is a holistic approach to delivering sustainable food and agricultural systems. It promotes the practices and methodologies of regenerative agriculture, um, an agroecological approach to agriculture that views agricultural areas as ecosystems and is concerned with the ecological impact of agricultural practices within your greater social, cultural and political contexts. So permaculture, biological farming, organic regenerative farming, these are all examples of agroecology. We want to create a better food system in Ireland, as I've mentioned, where all people have access to healthy, nutritious and affordable local food. Um, and we encourage you again to have a look at the website and explore our local food policy. We champion food sovereignty, um, where land, people and community are put at the center of food systems rather than agribusinesses and corporations. We stand with family farms and rural communities across Ireland and the world and ensure that living from the land and with the land is able to continue into the future. So food sovereignty is sort of in a nutshell would be a movement led from the ground up by farmers, fisher folk, foresters and land workers. And it's a food system that delivers social, environmental and economic sustainability. Talif Bio is also members of uh, La Via Campesina and its European committee, ECVC, we're part of a global movement of over 250,000 European farmers and 200 million 
uh, farmers, fisher folk, foresters, and agricultural workers across five continents. And then finally, we lead by example. Uh, farmlands are where the transition to sustainable food and agricultural systems are going to take place. And we start with getting our soil healthy, which leads me finally to looking at the um, environmental project that Porik mentioned in the introduction. Uh, Telef Bio has uh, a one year uh, biodiversity European Innovation Partnership project. Um, so let's have a look. As most produce, as we say, uh, except seafood is actually grown from soil, um, we believe that a key to maintaining global food security is fixing or regenerating and then nurturing our soils. So in a nutshell, soil security is food security. Now, globally, scientists are speaking about soil fertility depletion and how tilling and chemical fertilizers, sprays and pesticides are harming our food sources. And we know that modern industrial practices, which focus on economics and competition, on efficiencies and technical innovations, don't allow the soil to regenerate or function properly. So learning how to do this in practice is the aim and purpose of the, the, the biodiversity EIP. It's funded by EIP Agri and administered by the Department of Agriculture. Our project is a year, a one year EIP. Um, and as I say, focused about learning focusing on learning about soil biodiversity uh, below the soil and how to get it functioning again. Through the EIP, uh, we're learning that carbon feeds the soil and the soil food web, and that this in turn feeds plants, allowing them to produce yields of nutrient dense foods that are appropriate to our individual ecosystems, climates and cultures. The soil food web uh, refers to the multitude of life forms that we find in the soil. And these range from microscopic one-celled organisms like bacteria and algae to fungi and protozoa to larger nematodes, arthropods, earthworms, insects, plant roots, and small animals. And these life forms all break down or help to break down organic matter. They aerate the soil, they prey on unwanted pests, and they make nutrients available to the plants. Chemical fertilizers and pesticides, however, adversely affect many of these beneficial life forms in the soil, killing them or causing them to migrate and, and go dormant. Uh, chemical fertilizers are also highly soluble in water, so they leach into the groundwater before the plant has been able to use them. They also seep into the soil and into the subsoil, where they interact with clay, forming impenetrable layers. So when you have compacted soil and you have an absence of the soil bacteria to break down organic matter um, into plant nutrients, then the soil, the soil health is affected and therefore the plant's health is affected. Plants become instead addicted to the chemical fertilizer that we're putting out and they're unable to get the nutrients from the soil. So we have plants that grow, but they end up being neutrally def nutri <laughs> nutrient deficient. I was about to say nutritionally deficient. So soil bacteria also finally regulates um, disease, becomes lost, and so too is the function of keeping bugs and grubs and other, other parasites in check. So plants growing in these unhealthy soils tend to be attacked by disease, pests, and parasites. And the solution then becomes to apply more fertilizers and pesticides, which basically just furthers this deadly spiral. So as I mentioned earlier on, with the current focus with the, your, the war in the Ukraine and with the shortage and the high cost of chemical fertilizers for farmers, now would be the perfect time to transition away from chemical fertilizers and to start regenerating soils, breaking the addiction. Despite industry claims to the contrary, agroecological systems that do not use chemical fertilizers are resilient and are productive. And so I'd like to, to come back again then to say that if we were going to do anything to build food security in Ireland, your best starting point is to start with soil security and then to build local food networks and to start feeding Ireland local, healthy, chemical free, nutrient dense food. Thanks. Thanks very much, Bridgie. That was wonderful. Very exciting to see um, a lot of the work that's going on on the ground. And as you say, being led by farmers, uh, which is really critical. Um, we'll go next, thank you to uh, Oliver Moore, 
And Oliver, Oliver is editor in chief and communications director with ARC 2020, which is focused on policy research and communications on agri-food and rural issues in Europe. And you'll find uh, ARC 2020 on social media as well. And they're very uh, active in terms of uh, publishing very interesting articles and so on on this topic. Uh, Oliver also works with the Cultivate NGO on rural and agri-food related events and is researcher in an Irish context. He lives in Clock Jordan's Eco Village in County Tipperary, where he is also a director of the community owned farm. And uh, where he finds the time for all this, I don't know, but he also lectures in the Centre for Cooperative Studies in UCC on the MSC in Cooperatives, Agri-Food and Sustainable Development. So thank you very much uh, for coming along tonight, uh, Ollie, and you can share your screen in your own time. Great. Uh, thanks, Boric. Thanks for that. Um, can you see my screen? I can, yeah. Great. Okay, so I'll try not to cover what Bridget has covered already. I'll try and skip on through um, and maybe even get to talk about where I live. But I'm going to try and keep it a little bit broader on that kind of global food security and food security in Ireland kind of level first. So uh, this is what I'm going to try and cover. So in general terms, Ireland is considered food secure. Um, but we take away from the food security of the, of the world with our resource intensity. This is all the more serious with war and other crises. We're very exposed on feeds and fertilizers in particular, which has come up you know, again and again. Uh, the nitrates derogation you could describe as the linchpin to our expansionism. It's very difficult to square the circle of our emissions reductions targets and so on with the nitrates derogation being uh, what it is. Um, we can, what we can do to reduce exposure, I'll talk about a li little bit as well in terms of um, some aspects of the cap that are okay basically. And if I get time, I'll talk about Clot Jordan, but I'm not sure if I'll have time. Um, so just, you know, the most recent information on food security, we're always surprised sometimes to hear Ireland scores really well. Ireland is top of the class or first or second, sometimes with Singapore and so on. According to the Economist's um, research unit, this is the, the current figures. You know, so Ireland is top of the class again in food security, and we've been doing quite well in recent years. You can see uh, we've improved in the last 10 years and we've you know we've always been in the top few so how and why is that well it's because of affordability availability quality and safety and natural resources so they're the categories that the economist used um, when they're describing food security metrics so it's the global food security index is you know run by them but that's that's what they um use as their categories uh, like our, it's it's about 8.6 percent people in Ireland now spend on food. Um, it used to be like one third of our money around when we joined the the EU. So, you know, we have a cost of living crisis, but the price of food has never been lower. So, you know, there are areas you can see them then in more detail on the right. You can see um, what they consider to be important. So you can see like food loss, food safety, and so on aren't so aren't quite as high up as change in the average food costs. Now, this will probably change too. But it's changing everywhere um, so food prices will keep going up so we'll be like top of the class but we have to question how the class is performing as a class <laughs> as well um, so they, they're the categories they use to come up with food security in ireland so food security globally and this is how ireland ends up on top um, here's where we don't do well even though we come out on top we don't have much of an irrigation infrastructure um, and this is where you start to get one of the questions i noticed was about um should we grow more, more plant-based products and so on? One of the areas we fall down in, in food security, even according to this um, very neoliberal kind of metric, is that we're quite bad actually on cereals and horticulture. And that's coming stronger and stronger in this. So um, yeah, so our irrigation infrastructure is really poor. You know, we can't really cultivate, we can't really irrigate land if there's a drought. And there was a drought a couple of years ago, it lasted for two months. And we saw that there was a fodder crisis all of a sudden then. Um, but that's even bigger for horticulturalists and the like. Um, the volatility of agricultural production, um, well, this is basically about the fact that cereal and vegetable production is collapsing in Ireland. Um, so even, you know, the economist here is, is starting to point out that that's bad, even for our own food security. Other issues that they point, these are from the economist now as well, like this is not for me. Um, flooding, um, we're 10%, 10.9% more exposed to flooding than previously, than in the previous measures. Um, because there will be more flooding and we're not so prepared for it. Um, the drainage of organic soils is 
you know, increasing greenhouse gas emissions from Ireland. Um, and that's also a negative, they've, they've pointed out. Likewise, um, our water is in poor quality. You can see here from oceans, rivers, lakes, eutrophication. We um, import lots of food. Um, cereals was the metric they were using here as well. So we often talk about how Ireland feeds tens of millions of people, but we import huge amounts of food to feed animals to export food. So it's kind of, you know, we're a conduit for food, basically. Um, and interesting enough, because we're doing so well in food security ostensibly, we don't even pay attention to the concept. So they've actually pointed that out as well as being a negative. So even though we're top of the class, we can see that there is pressure coming in these areas. Um, import dependency in cereals, flooding, lack of horticulture infrastructure for dealing with climate change and so on. Other caveats being the best of a bad lot isn't great. You know, there's about a billion obese and a billion mal malnourished or starving in the world. Uh, we're third in the world for natural resources and resilience as an overarching category, yet we only score 70% of the available 100% here. Um, so we're doing very well in a place that has really strong pressure on natural resources and resilience. I would argue that using a country metric is quite limited for various reasons, including the fact that you know climate refugees will go to stable places if possible uh, when global shocks happen. And I think that, you know, surprisingly, The Economist uses a, maybe an overly optimistic neoliberal paradigm um, to assess uh, climate change, for example, and this is the stuff that came out a couple of weeks ago. This is the research that came out a couple of weeks ago that, um, you know, explained Ireland as being the most food secure country in the world. It uses mid-level IPCC predictions from 2014. Um, I would argue that mid-level IPCC predictions from 2014 are overly optimistic. I think things are on a far worse track in climate change terms than that, based on the actual behavior of multinational corporations and governments, not based on the promises they've made, based on their business plans, based on their investment plans. And I don't really think that people like Bolsonaro and Putin are thinking about climate change right now either. So I think it's very optimistic as well to, to presume that climate change will only impact us as much as is presumed in lots of these or neo neoliberal models. So war in Ukraine, I would say as well, doesn't mean a food security crisis. It means more an animal feed and mineral fertilizer exposure situation that needs a transition towards sustainable animal numbers, sustainable breeds and sustainable farming practices. Um, just as a little side thing as well, lots of the presumption, I mean, we're, we're in such a, there's such a, a presumption that the economy as it functions currently will be how it will be in perpetuity because it's working now, but it's completely based on fossil fuels. Um, and I'm using this as an example of um, be careful how estimates are given for, you know, how things will be as we enter uh, a world with more extreme crises. So in November 2019, um, statistical experts came up with this um, pandemic preparedness table. Right. Um, the United States came top in pandemic preparedness because it is a wealthy country uh, with, with free markets orientation and global trade options. So it was number one for pandemic preparedness. Vietnam was clocking in around between 90 and 100. Um, in, re in the end, you can see the figures here. Uh, the COVID deaths are going over a million now in the US and in Vietnam, they're still below 44,000. Um, now, I'm not saying that we should all have a government system like Vietnam, but what I am saying is that we're going to have to start planning and preparing for big shocks that will involve more planning and preparing, much like we had to plan and prepare for World War II, even, you know, even in Ireland. So, you know, we will need public planning. We've even seen calls for like ring fencing of green diesel levels for farming, for example. So that's the, you know, the Dairy Vision Board is coming up with some very interesting ideas, like how, how they'll be implemented is a different thing, uh, or, or if they'll be implemented, but certainly there's going to be a lot more planning than we're used to. Other caveats on Ireland being the most food secure place in the world, all of the areas we're doing badly in are still declining, and the cap is not going to help very much. Um, the crisis is getting worse, I've just described anyway. Our export model is completely dependent on increasingly expensive inputs, as Bridget was talking about as well. We keep having bailouts. Um, there's a pig meat bailout in April. There was another one in February. There's been four fodder bailouts. There's tillage money, 400 euros a hectare. There's more money for silage now as well. It's not being costed. It's not being written into a transition plan. There's some quotes there just from how dependent we are on, on Ukraine and Russia for fertilizers and feeds, but I won't go into that now. Another issue is that 
with the nitrates derogation, very few people will transition to organic dairy. Um, if we want to see lower numbers of uh, dairy cows in particular, there's going to have to be options, but as long as there's a nitrate derogation, the options will be limited because you can have more animals on per acre, basically, and have, you know, and that means more feed and that means more fertilizer um, and it means more absolute emissions in the end. Um, yeah, so we, we over specialize. Um, we've lost, we lost 20% of our feed grain capacity in just four years. For example, according to uh, Chagas's crop, Crops 2030 document, I'm going to I'll make this presentation available to Porik as well, and he can he can have it on the website there as well, because there's lots of links that you can follow. Um, so while our our grain acreage is going down, while our our we're completely dependent on feed imports in in some significant categories, you can see the figures there, like you know combined drop of all winter cereals by 47% according to the most recent figures from the CSO. Um, but meanwhile, cattle numbers are still growing according to the most recent figures, up 44,000, but dairy cows making up over two quarters of that. So we're, we're avoiding transition. We've just, sorry, bad news there, uh, in a way, we've just announced the nitrate derogation again, um, that it's gonna carry on for a few more years. Um, now I know nitrates is about water quality, um, the nitrate derogation, but like we have absolute emissions targets now to reach. It's going to be increasingly hard to reach those if we keep increasing the number of, of dairy cows because it's not about efficiency, it's about absolute overall emissions. Um, yeah, and also only four member states were left using this in Ireland. This is from the European Court of Auditors. They, they earmarked Ireland and gave us a couple of paragraphs in their most recent report on how bad CAP is for climate change. Um, and what they, they pointed to was the fact that there's only four countries left using the nitrates derogation now. And Ireland is the one that's increasing its use of it, as you can see, up, up by 38%. Um, here's a quote from um, an article I published, but this is a quote from the, the European Court of Auditors. Um, yeah, Belgium, Denmark, Ireland and the Netherlands are the last four countries left with a derogation, but we've increased our use of it and we've just announced it again. Um, so how are we going to reduce our emissions by between 21 and 30% in, in agriculture and up to 58% in land use, land use change in forestry, if in fact we're also increasing um, the number of, of dairy cows. So disaster capitalism um, never missed the opportunity a good crisis offers. So unfortunately, every crisis, you can see some of them here, is an excuse for not making the transition because it's an emergency. But we live in an era of permanent emergency. So what are we gonna do? Uh, unfortunately, the cap that we're about to agree won't help much. The only good news is that the European Commission sent us a brutal letter of complaint saying, you know, you're not really going to do any of the targets that you've, you've set. And if you haven't set targets, you should be setting targets. And your own environmental assessment isn't even being, being reached. But I'll come to that in a second. There are some good things about the new cap. I'm not going to complain about everything. Um, the cooperation projects are a nice idea. Um, they'll bring 10,000 or so farmers on board into landscape-based environmental practices. This is a good thing. Um, there's rules about eligible acres that will be applied to all farmland, which is good. It might reduce scrub burning um, next spring and the spring after and so on. There's been the smallest amount of cash redistribution possible over the longest time period allowable, but that's progress in Ireland in terms of um, farmers in high nature value regions having the potential to be able to compete at least um, with, with farmers elsewhere. But we don't have any climate targets. We've unambitious eco schemes um, and it doesn't meet its own environmental assessment. This is what the European Commission said to Ireland about its cap plan. The Commission has doubts about the effective contribution of the cap strategic plan to the general cap objective on environmental protection. This is one of the three overarching cap objectives. It is in this context that further improvements and more ambition are required for the Commission to approve the cap strategic plan. Now, I like their use of the word required because that is a more significant word than your average word. And they also use the word stipulate later, which I really like as well, because I think you, it's harder to avoid a requirement or a stipulation than it is a request. So this is the stage we're at now. The Irish Department of Agriculture will be writing to the European Commission to respond to the letter that the European Commission has sent to Ireland. There'll be some over and back and something will happen. So there might be some improvements. But as you can see, they, they name this specifically, and this is the European Commission, this is what they say. The Commission has doubts whether what is proposed goes far enough. In this context, it is 
It particularly has in mind the substantial growth in the size of the Irish dairy herd in recent years, a growth which has had very substantial implications for agricultural greenhouse gas emissions, for quality of air, water and soil and for biodiversity. So that's a quote from the Commission talking about how you can't keep doing that and expect to achieve your other targets. There's still just about time to change some of these things. According to the cap that was agreed in December uh, 2021, um, eco schemes, which are a new part of Pillar 1 and cap, um, their options farmers have to get all their Pillar 1 money, they can do some schemes which will um, improve environmental performance. The problem is the, the way Ireland has written them, they're unambitious. They're designed to get everyone on board and then the ambition might come later. That's Ireland's thinking. But in the letter the Commission sent to Ireland, it's, it's in the link actually previously there, so you can find that on that slide. Um, the Commission says you can't do it that way. You have to show ambition and measurability. So it has, the eco schemes have to improve year on year. So it could be more farmers join the darker green eco schemes, for example, but, or a bigger acreage overall gets into an eco scheme. There has to be something like this done. But also they use the word stipulate. So they said like the cap that was agreed that now has to be implemented stipulates that ambition should happen. So that gives me hope because stipulate and required are stronger words than your typical word. I would argue that if the cap legislation stipulates that we need to show ambition and measurability in our eco schemes and we don't do it, I would argue that we're leaving ourselves exposed to a legal case because if it's in, if it's stipulated in the cap rules, how can you avoid it? So something has to give here, I would say, and the next two or three months will decide what happens on that. Um, I think smaller things, the cap payments in organics um, need to be higher for livestock. They're very low in the, the plan submitted to the Commission. I would argue that they should be increased because organic has a lower stocking rate, doesn't use fertilizers and has by law lower levels of feed. Um, oh, and yeah, that's probably enough for me because I've talked for loads of time. Um, thanks. Thanks, Ollie. You were going to tell us a bit about Clock Jordan. If you have a few minutes, if you want oh, to. Oh, great. OK, well, that's lovely. Um, I'll do that. So I'll, I'll use the report, actually, that we published just to because um, it's full of pictures of Clock Jordan. Um, so, yeah, so basically where I live, it's 67 acres. It's an intentional community, so it's an eco village. Um, and people just came together and did the hard work of trying to get a community set up, which tries to abide by kind of the the basic kind of living world capacity level, like in terms of energy, food, uh, sustainable building and so on. So every house has a high energy rating. We have our own farm, we have an energy barn. So there's like one, one you know, unit to, to heat 50 of the 53 houses that are here. Um, there's about 2000 fruiting trees on site, about 400 of those are apple trees. Uh, the rest are more for berries, um, some cherries and, and plums and pears and so on as well. And because we have these fruiting trees on site, we have apple festivals, we, I process about 400 apples myself a year, so I have them all year round just from a dehydrator. Um, we have co-working space, there's a train station in town. So, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm able to work, I, I teach in UCC, but I can get the train down, teach for a few hours, get the train back up again. Um, I can get to Dublin quite easily as well, uh, but I can do a lot of my work from here, whether it's like this um, or in the eco village where I do some work with, with cultivate. So it's, oh yeah, let me just pull up the, the image there for you, or a few images. So yeah, so this is, let me share the screen there now again. This here, this report, the front cover of it, this is some of the veg we produce. Um, we produce about 50 different types of vegetables. We produce about 11 tons of vegetables on a six acre farm. The turnover is 202,000 euros a year. Um, we train 10 people to 15 people a year. We pay farmers uh, a living wage and we bring in part of that 202,000 euros from our last audited books. That was also from European training schemes. So, you know, we, we get about 80 grand from members fees. Um, but on six acres, we can generate that much activity, that much life. And still one third of the land is in green manures at any one time on, on those six acres. So when you start to think about you know, people say organic isn't quite as high yielding as conventional in certain categories. It's like, well, you know, vegetables with green manures and, and crop rotations and so on are, are very, um, very good for, <laughs> for yield. Like this, that, how much 
like you know how much milk or meat will you get out of six acres really you know compared to 50 different types of vegetables um you know so it's there's people can ask me more direct and specific questions again but that's this report that we published i just used a lot of pictures from the eco village because that's that's the that's it there that's a slightly different view of it than people normally see so my house is there um the farm is over here and you can see it's uh it's green um yeah and the tree filled and so on so yeah that's probably enough for me park um but i can i can answer people's questions about the eco village more as well oh, yeah fabulous yeah no it's it's wonderful to see the aerial photograph of it and see how it's quite a different looking landscape to the um to the surrounding fields and so on um and it's wonderful that uh, that uh, the, the project is going well. So look, we have uh, just under 15 minutes left. Um, I see there's a few questions in there already. So just for, for people watching, uh, please put your questions to the Q&A button. Um, I'll go to you, uh, Bridgie, please. You mentioned in your uh, presentation um, the role of women a few times. Um, can you elaborate on uh, on what you mean by that, and maybe what are the barriers to greater participation or acknowledgement? Uh, maybe is the, the, the better the better word uh, of of women in agriculture. Great. Uh, you know, if I'm going to look at it globally, um, and I'm sure people can hear from my really peachy accent. There was a lot of time spent in Africa. Um, I would have worked with a lot of communities that were looking at uh, being self-sufficient themselves. Now, in, in the more global context, we acknowledge that a massive amount of, of food is produced locally and by, you know, local community. And within that, you're talking about women. Um, so I'd, I'd, I'd separate it first, you know, woman and island, and then sort of your more global. But certainly, as I say, women are, are front and center to food production globally. In Ireland itself, if you have a look, we had this artificial kind of construct uh, back, back at the sort of like beginning of the state where the IFA was set up and, and, and you've got the men kind of dealing with the politics and, and your big livestock and you've got the ICA, which dealt with the country markets and the smaller livestock and things like jam making and all of the diversification. So ironically, even when we see now about diversification on farms, you see women tending to lead that. Um, but where you're not seeing women is in that policy space, in those at those tables where we're discussing what does our food production look like and how do we use resources. So the second kind of part of that really was, you know, what what is going to happen? Say, for example, under the new cap, I mean, there there, there, there has been. Um, a bit of a focus uh, for, for women, but once again, I think we need to kind of target that a bit better. So I'd, I'd pull up the examples here of, um, you know, there's there's talk of a 60% grant for women um, under the, the targeted agricultural modernization scheme, uh, TAMS. The only problem is, is that if you're a woman on your own, you cannot get access to credit and these, these schemes need for you to pay up front and claim back later. So basically, your most vulnerable people are the ones that can't access it, whereas people that are already perhaps getting a higher payment or are, are part of a partnership or have a partner, they're able to kind of access access those. So yeah, two things. Women, women are definitely kind of crucial to any discussion on food, you know, because we bring in a perspective that, that has been overlooked. And secondly, whatever... Uh, Supports and resources and schemes are made available to women, need to be designed by women because what is being designed actually isn't fit for purpose. It doesn't land where it needs to land. Yeah, very good, very good. And I suppose it just ties it into a broader argument about gender equality in, in a kind of every aspect of our society uh, as well. It's not just agriculture. Um, Ali, um, Colleen asked a question in the chat here, uh, and he says, how can you describe Ireland as food secure when we import all of almost all of our fr fruit and veg? And this is a theme that I see quite a lot about um, 
our ability to feed ourselves within our own borders. Uh, and I suppose then we're talking about trade. And, and so what, what is the, do we, do we need to minimize trade in food uh, to be food secure or where does that fit in? Yeah, hi, uh, I, know, I, I would say no. Um, even in World War II, Britain imported from Canada lots of its grain, and it did amazing work to make itself more able to feed itself. It still did need trade, and trade will help with durables. Durables, you know, probably will have to be traded, even if we make local economies, local communities very resilient. You know, durables help avoid famines, um, really, because, you know, Argentina and Australia will replace, you know, Ukrainian grain to some extent um, for Indonesia to Egypt, that strip of the world. And if it, you know, Egypt is going, is going to try and ramp, massively ramp up what, it's, what, it, what it can do itself. But I, th I think trade is, and, and one of the reasons they say Ireland is food secure is because we're in the EU and we can just get the fruit from Europe. You know, like in 1978, we dug up all our apple trees and set them on fire um, because the five years of um, grace period for the common market was up and all the French apples appeared, the big, huge, juicy French apples. The Irish apples couldn't compete. So the farmers, I spoke to some farmers who did it, like they've gone back into apples since, but they they remember the, the pyres of apple trees. Um, I don't think that's the right thing to do. I live in a community where we have hundreds of apple trees and we have apple festivals and we, you know, so I, that's my preference. But in terms of global food security, trade has some relevancies. But so contrast, for example, the apple farmer in South Tip wrote a piece for that report um, I shared and, you know, I can share it in the comments there as well. You know, because we're such a low population country with so much um, agri-food exports, we kind of lose sense of perspective of how little would actually be needed to feed ourselves in fruit, for example. It wouldn't take up a huge amount um, because we're exporting nine times more meat and milk than we can consume ourselves. So the amount of actual land you would need to grow enough fruit for Ireland isn't, isn't huge. So I'd personally prefer to see um, a thriving, resilient rural Ireland full of, like every village should have a community farm next door to it, supplying 10 or 15 tons of vegetables into it and fruits. Uh, and that should happen through various measures. There isn't even a small farming scheme in CAP. But it depends on how you view food security. Um, it depends on how you view trade. And, you know, somebody mentioned in the comments about ships being sunk and so on. I mean, it can absolutely can happen in a war situation. And we're in a bit of a war situation now. Um, you know, it's but there's going to be a food ombudsman coming in now that was announced as well. And that might reduce minimum pricing. Um, in supermarkets, which might help farmers. But we have to make sure it doesn't punish uh, people on low incomes who need access. And we don't want to embed food banks either, which, you know, just food waste initiatives that end up embedding sort of, you know, re low prices for farmers. There's a lot of things to be tackled at once. Um, but, you know, we could do it. Um, we should do it in terms of increasing our, food, our, our fruit and vegetable resilience. And I think now is the time to start moving into that. But in technical terms, we're officially food secure because we can get it. You know, that's how it's kind of measured. But that doesn't mean I believe it's the right thing to do necessarily. I think we should have a more resilient uh, local economy. You mentioned in your talk uh, that we're going to need more planning. And I'm just wondering, I mean, are we, are we to get to the, 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 the kind of things that you're talking about? Is that, are we talking about central planning? Are we talking about a government plan, let's say, to grow X amount of apples every year? And presumably, um, there'd have to be subsidies then paying farmers to do just that. Is that the kind of thing we're talking about? Yeah, well, I mean, we've come up with immediate subsidies out of nowhere for growing um, silage and growing cereal crops to, to feed animals as an emergency measure for the winter ahead. We could also just slightly reduce the number of animals that need to be fed, um, and that would take the pressure off. And it's costing hundreds of euros a hectare for the Irish Exchequer to come up with this. Likewise, we've come up with another bailout for the, the pig industry. Obviously, they need it, but it's very exposed to feed costs. Um, so, you know, it's, but yeah, in terms of planning, like in a way, the 21 to 30 percent emissions reductions target for agriculture is that, you know, and in a way, 
the Paris Accord is that at a global level. It's how we actually implement it and what the rules will be around it and how that integrates with other policies like the rural futures policy that we have, um, like CAP and so on. Like There's nothing about climate in CAP, um, which is ridiculous. The Chagas Mac curve will not reach the 21 to 30%. It might not even reach its own targets, which is less than 21%. So, you know, things have to be changed that, you know, and they have to be integrated well with each other so that we can have a resilient community. Like, for example, the biodiversity strategy for the EU points out that organic farming is just a little bit more labor intensive. Um, and that's jobs rich. That's not just people sometimes see that as a drain. And we don't want to bring back all the drudgery, but we definitely need a little bit more of a, pl a planned approach. And we can use CAP as a, as a baseline and the climate action plan as a baseline to to adjust what we what we do. Yeah, <clears throat> thanks. So, uh, Sean, uh, and hi, Sean, uh, has made a comment there about, you know, making the link between food security and energy security. And, uh, of course, uh, artificial fertilizers are very, it's a very uh, fossil fuel intensive uh, process. And uh, one of the, the maybe common denominators uh, that we hear a lot of talk, whether it's uh, about food sovereignty or environmental problems, is about artificial fertilizer. And you mentioned it, uh, Bridgie, in your in your talk um, a few times, because we have a very, uh, and it's not just uh, uh, animal agriculture. It's uh, you know crops are very very dependent on nitrogen as well. So, if we were to get off nitrogen, if we were to say, okay, we want to be uh, free of using uh, these chemicals, how quickly would that take? And uh, I'm just thinking, what what kind of time scale are we talking about? And and how, what kind of an impact would that have on maybe what you might call conventional Irish farmers? Great. Well, you know, we talk about the fact that um, that we do need to kind of cut down, and we've got all these nitrates. You know, the nitrates directives and the targets. So straight away there is this acknowledgement that there's going to be a weaning a weaning off. And I do think that if we have a look, say, for example, at different mechanisms, if we look at organic farming, they would look at a two, three, four, five year in conversion pro process because your soils are going to take a certain number of years um, to bounce back and to start regenerating. It, it won't be immediate. Um, so I, I do think that that's, that's important to kind of note. It doesn't mean, though, that you actually need to be throwing the fertilizers out at the same time. I think you just acknowledge that there is going to be a drop in productivity until such time as the natural system starts, starts working. Um, that drop, however, is going to exist if we carry on throwing out the fertilizers, because what we're finding is we need to throw out more and more and more to stay at the same place. So in terms of fertilizer, Whichever way we look at it, we need to start weaning ourselves off and moving away from it. So that's point number one. The second point is, yes, it'll take a couple of years. And in those couple of years, we need to, to, to put in those in conversion kind of processes. But I think it's also important to kind of acknowledge how much energy and, and, and certainly the contribution of our fossil fertilizers are to, to the environment and to things like greenhouse gases. I mean, 2% two, 2 of greenhouse gas emissions come from synthetic fertil fertilizers, whether that be the making of them because they're extremely energy intense to make, um, and then the effects of when you put them into the soil and what happens. So, I mean, if we wanting to make a massive contribution to something, nitrates is just, I mean, it's, it's your natural go-to. You know, so basically put those supports in place for farmers to make that conversion to organic. And as Ollie said, the payments at the moment aren't there to encourage farmers to do that. Um, as a matter of fact, I mean, we don't even make 2% of organic farmers in this country. And we are actually facing a bit of a drop in our organic farmers, not for any other reason than the most of them joined in the 90s. And those farmers are actually aging out at the moment. And of course, the land is going to people that, that might be selling it off or whatever for things like forestry. So the answer really, we need to wean off, 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 off those fertilizers and, and we need to build in that transition period and we need to make it viable for farmers to do that. 
Thanks, Bridgie. So we're, we're nearing eight o'clock, but I'd like to get one last question in because I think it's very interesting and it comes from Donald and uh, he talks about Singapore, which also features quite high in that uh, international rating, I think, on food security, even though it's it's a tiny place. And uh, Donald is talking about, he says that Singapore has made a strong focus on growing food locally, even though Singapore is essentially an urban country. And, um, and he says CAP doesn't mention urban agriculture. Um, so what, that's a very interesting point. I mean, can, can cities or what can cities contribute, uh, Ali, do you think, to our, our food security? Yeah, so like the, certainly farmers markets and CSAs and so on could really be ringing cities and supplying cities um, which, you know, to some extent, you know, North, North County Dublin used to be a place that supplied Dublin City with vegetables. Um, it still is to some extent, but not as much as it as it was. Um, but urban areas like vegetables are perishable typically, but there is also, you know, the more durable vegetables. But getting in and out to cities from the area around Dublin um, is absolutely core. And for all other cities, uh, for vegetable production, we need to just basically make planning and other rules you know amenable to um increasing those things because at the moment they're decreasing the number of people in horticulture is decreasing and decreasing and decreasing organics you know is horticulture is quite strong in organics and the payments for organic horse will double potentially now in the new cap which is fantastic i'm, not, I'm not all negative about cap and so on but there's you know 50 friends could come together in a whatsapp group and make an arrangement with a farmer to get to give them 50 grand a year for a guaranteed supply of vegetables. It's kind of that simple now. And we need to start doing that um, as a thing. That's how one of the CSAs in Dublin actually started the Community Supported Agriculture Initiatives. A group of consumers who went to a farmer's market just, and were in a transition towns group, just kind of came together and said, well, why don't we just ask the farmer if we can regularize the arrangement? Um, that was all it took. You know, you might be buying from a vegetable producer now who'd be very approachable um to actually doing something similar you know and, and they could still have their farmer's market because the vegetable pickup point was the farmer's market so the market still did well in this situation so you know we need to start doing that um and cities are the place where you can do that because the population base is really low here in clot jordan it's hard to sustain it like we've actually got a digital farmer's market which is community owned you know precisely because the farmer can just turn up with the delivery and not stand around all day in a town of a few hundred people you know, so cities have a lot of responsibility um, to start doing more allotments, more community gardens and so on. And there's been a big move towards that in recent years, which is great. Like 30 years ago, there were no community gardens or allotments bar a couple in you know, Dublin and Belfast. It almost didn't exist as a concept in Ireland. Now it's here and that's good. So there's progress in schools, there's progress in allotments, there's progress in community gardens. You know, there is some progress being made. Um, but the pace of which we need to be making these changes is is way beyond what is actually happening. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very good, very good. Well, look, we we leave it at there uh, uh, for tonight. Um, uh, it's always fascinating to talk to you both. And uh, the, in our last webinar, uh, which is on our YouTube channel, we spoke to a number of farmers in the Farmers for Nature uh, program that are that are also, you know, uh, uh, you know implementing or leading on the, the climate and biodiversity emergency. So it's wonderful to, to hear from them. I always find it's, it can be quite despairing to, uh, you know, talk about the policy level. There seems to be so, so little willingness to face up to the challenges uh, we have. Uh, whereas it's, uh, it's it's a great antidote to, to speak to people like yourselves who are, you know, actually doing the things on the ground and showing and showing us what's possible. Um, so with that, um, I want to thank you all uh, at home for taking part. Um, once again, the, uh, the webinar will be on our, uh, our YouTube channel to watch back. And I want to thank once again, uh, Bridgie and Ali for your, for your wonderful insights. And, uh, and just finally go on to iwt.ie and uh, join the IWT and support uh, what we do if you like what we do. So thanks again, everybody, and good night.